I would like you to consider two trends. The first is that crime rates have been decreasing and falling rapidly in Australia and in many other countries around the world. The second trend is that at the same time, the number of criminal offences that have been created has been increasing rapidly and the prison population has been expanding exponentially. So what's wrong with this picture? The crime problem is getting smaller, yet the solutions, criminal offences and imprisonment, are getting much larger. Mass incarceration has attracted a lot of attention lately, particularly in the US. Today, what I want to speak to you about is the other area of growth, criminal lawmaking. As a society, we have been trained to associate more criminal laws, more police power, more imprisonment, with a safer and better society. <clears throat> I want to challenge that conventional wisdom and explain why criminalisation as a public policy tool should be used sparingly. I will outline four reasons why more is not better. The first is we have an accumulation problem. The number and diversity of offences in Australia is staggering. Many of us would recognise widely harmful behaviours like murder and rape. But what you don't realise is the statute books are laden with offences that intrude on daily aspects of our lives. Did you know that it's an offence in some places to fly a kite in a public place, to beg, to sing an obscene song or to skateboard? I don't know about you, but I always loved flying a kite and at one point I was pretty good on a skateboard. Offences also don't come off the statute books at the same rate that they come on. Decriminalisation does occur. Homosexuality and vagrancy are examples. But these moments are rare. Why? Because criminal lawmaking is a highly politicised activity. And that brings me to problem number two. Criminal laws often get made for the wrong reasons and take the wrong form. Law and order is a staple of our election cycle. Effective criminal lawmaking is equated with severity. Governments are more, less interested in what the crime experts have to say about crime and its solutions and are more interested in the anxieties of the people, the electorate. What becomes important is the moment of political announcement and what the new law symbolises. Whether or not there is a genuine gap that is going to be filled or whether the new law will be effective are of secondary importance. A third problem is cost. The Productivity Commission has estimated that the criminal justice system costs Australian governments $15 billion a year. It costs $300 a day to keep one person in jail and with 40,000 people in Australia in jail, the bill for today alone is $12 million. A fourth and final problem is that there is a risk of unintended consequences. It's bad enough if a new law is ignored and it remains idle on the statute books. But it is much worse if a new law is used in ways that are entirely inconsistent with the stated rationale for introducing it. So four problems. Um, too many laws, wrong reasons, cost and unintended consequences. I now want to illustrate through a recent powerful example the reasons why we should be concerned with over usage of criminal lawmaking as a public policy strategy. In July 2012, Thomas Kelly was starting his first night out in one of Sydney's most famous entertainment spots, King's Cross. He was walking down the footpath when he was king hit in the head in a random and senseless act of alcohol-fueled violence. 
The force of the blow led him to fall backwards, hitting his head on the pavement where he suffered massive brain injuries and never regained consciousness. Ten days later, the young man responsible for the attack, Kieran Loveridge, was arrested and charged with murder. Some time later, he pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to four years minimum term for the manslaughter. The outrage from the media and the community was immediate. Pressure intensified to take tough action in relation to alcohol fuel violence when another young man on New Year's Eve 2013, Daniel Christie, was also killed in a one-punch attack in King's Cross. In January 2014, the New South Wales Parliament responded in classic law and order fashion. The Parliament enacted two new offences, assault causing death and an aggravated version where the offender is intoxicated, which carries a mandatory minimum sentence of eight years. Colloquially, these laws are known as the one-punch law. The move attracted widespread criticism from legal experts, myself included. Why? Because quite simply, the existing law of murder and manslaughter already covered these types of offences. So why did the government respond in the way that it did? Our political leaders were concerned above all else with what the PR types call the optics. The government wanted to be seen to have acted decisively in relation to community anxieties over alcohol fueled violence. At the time, the Parliament also made changes to liquor licensing laws. These so-called lockout laws operate in Sydney CBD and King's Cross precincts. They provide that no one can enter a nightclub after 1.30am and that the service of alcohol must cease at 3am. Two years on, we now have the opportunity to assess which of these levers, the punitive one-punch law or the more pragmatic lockout laws, have been more effective in reducing alcohol-related assaults. To date, no person has been convicted of assault causing death or its aggravated version. There are a number of charges pending, but the first matter ended in a hung jury and another matter has been delayed by constitutional challenge. By contrast, there is strong evidence to suggest that the lockout laws have reduced alcohol-related violence in King's Cross by a staggering 45% and in the CBD by just over 20%. So some of you might be sitting here thinking, well, if the one-punch law didn't really play any role, what's the problem with its creation? The problem is that once an offence is created, it is permanent and may operate in unintended ways. My research in relation to the Western Australian experience of enacting a one-punch law in 2008 demonstrates that only one prosecution involved classic random street violence. Disturbingly, 40% of prosecutions involve men killing their partners or ex-partners in circumstances where there was a history of violence and abuse. This meant these men, responsible for very serious domestic violence killings, were receiving a more lenient sentence than had they been convicted of manslaughter. This was not why the one-punch law was introduced in Western Australia, but it is the way it has operated. <clears throat> in conclusion, using and creating new criminal punitive offences is only one of the political tools available to a government to address a harm or risk. Using the criminal law is a political choice. It's not always the best choice. Creating a new criminal offence should be a last resort, reserved for cases where there is a genuine gap. The creation in 2014 
of an offence of strangulation in New South Wales is a good example. Studies have shown that strangulation is a red flag indicator to future fatal violence. More criminal laws was required here in order to protect victims of such life-threatening violence. It might be too much to expect that the New South Wales Parliament will concede that the one-punch law was unnecessary and repeal it. It's worth remembering that is an option. But the more important lesson to be learned here is that the more is better equation does not and should not apply to criminal lawmaking.